Good evening, or good day, it all depends, and welcome back to the Impossible Iron Man channel. Back by popular demand, I have for you episode two of Players Won't Teach It, covering when to be aggressive versus defensive in general gunplay. It was my most requested topic to cover in my evasion guide, so let's get into it. We'll begin by going over some guidelines as well as the golden rule that stands above all else. You dictate the pace of battle. Don't play on the enemy's terms. This is the single best piece of advice I've ever been given for playing Hunt. While it may seem a bit obvious on its face, we'll revisit what this truly entails throughout the video. Following this, we have a macro checklist, or winning the war, if you will, and a micro checklist, or surviving the battle. Notice I said surviving here, as this will lead to winning the game overall, so long as you can survive your individual engagements. So let's go over the macro checklist. The first step, even before any kind of engagement starts, is to gain information. For example, how many are there? Never assume someone is a solo, by the way. This assumption has gotten me killed. A lot more than I'd like to admit. Where are they headed? Is it to the next clue, boss banish, or extraction? This information will help you find an angle on them, or even set up an ambush. What loadouts are they using? Perhaps they've been shooting AI or fighting another team. If you're ex an experienced enough player to tell what kind of weapons they're using via audio, this can perhaps also tell you how to best engage them. The fight for information also takes place throughout a battle, so don't hesitate to slow down and take a second to determine where your enemy's positions are, if you're being flanked, or if another team is on the way. Let's look at a couple clips that demonstrate proper information gathering. Hmm, still definitely in there. Oh, yeah, right here. Oh, yeah, right here. He's at this window right now. Like, on the ping. I can't see, I could never see what they have. They definitely both have big rifles. When Thistlewain says, big rifles, we had already determined that one was using a martini. So while we may not have all the specifics, we know they're wielding long ammo at the least. So now we know where in the building they are, the angles being held, and the loadouts. Remember how I said, don't play on the enemy's terms? This tells us that they want us to take bad peaks in a war of attrition, or have us rush into what we suspect is a heavily trapped building. With this in mind, as well as noting that they have no extraction in the immediate area, we can take our time utilizing hidden angles and threaten their defense with the match timer. <laughs> oh, they're not even to Slaughterhouse, they're just barely past healing. Haha, ha, we stranded an entire fucking team on the map. <laughs> In the next clip, we find ourselves at a stalemate with a trio we had been fighting across the road, as well as a bounty team at Goddard. Is this door open? Yep, there's one in here. Yep, yep, yep. Is I see. He's, he's peeking out. He closed the door. So they're all just hiding in the fucking house. I only saw the one. I only saw the one. Yep, still only see the one. That's it, me. That's from over here somewhere. He killed it. So that was, uh, that was left of the house, I want to say. Stalker beetles are great tools for gathering information and then using that to break stalemates. In this case, Thistlewain was able to use the beetle to determine the approximate locations of all the enemy trio we had been facing. One by the horses, hence the proximity alert, 
one at the house right across from us, and one to the left who had been keeping an eye on the boss layer. We tried to use that info to push across and isolate one of the enemy team members, but I think had we taken the time to really parse through that information, we would have determined that instead of an aggressive solution, a better solution was a defensive one. Instead, moving south to sandwich the bounty team in between us and the team we had been fighting. That way, no matter what direction they ran, they were going to end up fighting teams on both sides, ensuring that we had a better shot at the objective, as well as only having to fight one team at a time, instead of the scenario that played out where we ended up having to fight everyone at once, narrowly getting out of the map alive. Next up on our checklist, look to take map control. Not only should you aim to start the fight from an advantageous position, i.e. high ground, but you should continuously deprive your opponents of room to maneuver in. One of the biggest mistakes I see players make is rushing hunters as soon as they get a tag. You're either going to get kited or walk into crossfire. So instead of walking into a trap, either figuratively or literally, deprive them of options and let them make the mistake. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't push opponents directly, far from it, but you want to avoid scenarios like the following. Got the one on the roof. There's one back here. You hit the one on the roof, you killed him. I killed him. They're behind the barn somewhere. Oh, in here. Bomb lance, bomb lance, rushing, bomb bomb lance. lance rushing. Help. They got me. Yep. Fuck, I couldn't get away from the bomb lance. Killed him. Sadly, we tunnel visioned and walked straight into a trap. The hunter on the roof had been bait, with two other close range hunters waiting in ambush in the building below. Upon realizing this, our push fell apart and our greed lost us the game when we all panicked. While aggression was the right move here, we should have instead sought to take map control by surrounding the building with one person watching the downed hunter on the roof, thus putting a chokehold on their options and maneuverability, where we can then seek to break parity, which is something I will be covering in the micro checklist. The next clip demonstrates proper aggression. We get a kill and look to push the enemy team towards the back of Lock Bay, which, as most of you know, is surrounded by water. A big old death trap. The pressure causes the team to go for a bad revive, exposing one of the members and breaking parity for us by giving two of them the Trinity of Pain achievement. Killed one. He was beetling just out in the goddamn open. Where's that body? I'm gonna light it on fire. Burning. Okay, I have a beetle out. I'm looking around. They should be this side somewhere. Yep. Possibly behind that fence. I'm gonna get up into the White House. Yeah, moving in the water. They're going for the res, they're going for the res. What are you doing it now? I it. might have killed him, I might have killed him. Oh, you killed him, Someone you died. killed him. I killed him with the beetle. Yeah, you, <laughs> killed, <laughs> yeah, you killed him right here. Hold on, there's yep. still someone in the water. I need to hear. A mountain man. Oh, they got him back up. Oh, they got him back up. That got him. What the fuck? He's down here. There's two of them down here. Possibly under Right the down here? Yeah. He's covering. That. That's cover fire. They're gonna charge us. They're in the water. 
There's one in the building, I'm pretty sure. Oh, fuck. Is that right? One's throwing. One. Pushing up. I have three more points on the macro checklist, but this is the last clip I'll use for it, as I believe what I've shown conveys the rest of the steps nicely. For this last clip, I want to showcase dictating the pace of battle, or step three on the macro list. We know that the enemies are using a Sparks and a Nagant Precision, so they're looking for medium to long range combat. I'd rather fight up close so I avoid giving them opportunities to engage me within their effective range, instead creating a fast-paced, high-mobility combat scenario that favors my loadout. You mean in the low barn? Yeah. One of them is definitely still in here. You want me to go kick his ass? I could definitely use backup, yeah. Alright. Let me do this. Alright, I'm gonna go throw a, uh... Oh, on the roof, on the roof. I think he saw me. Bleeding. One on the roof. Yep. On the Fuck window. Him. Are you shitting me? That was at the peak of my jump. Oh shit, wait, just play, 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 play cool, play cool, play cool. Go back for me, go back for me. Or not. Shit, that works, I'm gonna be impressed. And it works. Because I heard them run towards the west end to look for me. Mm -hmm. On the metal? I'm throwing a decoy? What the fuck? Seven meters, apparently. Thank you. Shotgun.
What? What? Get some. <laughs> <laughs> While I needed to create some up-close chaos in that last clip, based on your loadout, you could easily do the opposite. Use the clip in the background as an example. Instead, slowing things down, using rotations in the terrain to fight to your strengths. Just remember to be flexible as the engagement unfolds, and use the previous steps to gauge the pace at which you need to do battle. For our last two points on the macro list, we have secure an advantage, and finish the fight without rushing it. Securing an advantage will typically come in the form of getting a kill in a team fight after or while establishing map control. However, it can come in more subtle forms as well. Covering a downed hunter via burning or concertina wire comes to mind here, isolating then collapsing on a hunter that has strayed too far away from teammates, even stealing a boss banish to deny the enemy team much needed health bars. In a game where it is really, really easy to instantly die, especially when put on the back foot, any kind of advantage you can secure can mean the difference between losing or winning the match. This is the moment when the gears start to shift. You start applying pressure, and instead of immediately flipping a switch between going from defensive to aggressive, this is when you really start to hit that tipping point that leans far more towards being aggressive. As for the last bit, finishing the fight without rushing it, this can apply to multiple things. The idea seems really simple, yet it is one of the most frequent mistakes I see hunters make. Honestly, most of the highlight clips I see from creators are this scenario. Two trios fight each other, one team has everyone standing, and the other gets whittled down to one player. The full team gets greedy and rushes the last member of the other team, but they don't coordinate their attack. They all turn corners separately, often using poorly executed flanks. Each attacking member reveals themselves one at a time, getting headshot one after the other when they could have avoided throwing the game by engaging simultaneously. This applies to the objective as well, especially when people fool themselves into a false sense of security after not being contested for a while. Unless you body count and actually confirm that the server has been wiped, don't assume you're in the clear. I made this glaring mistake on stream once, eliminating eight people as a solo at Reeves Quarry. I had used up all of my scan during the fighting, and simply assumed when I was done looting that anyone left had died elsewhere. I waltzed right up to the nearest extraction, sprinting straight at it in the open, I realized too late that I wasn't alone, getting sniped by long ammo extraction campers that had waited for 45 minutes in nearby bushes. The match timer was still an hour at the time. Right as the proximity alarm went off at the extraction. All of that to say, it's not over till it's over. Play it 100% until you confirm a server wipe or you're in the post game screen. Now, this doesn't mean be passive until the end. This is definitely the time to be aggressive, very aggressive. Just don't be foolish about it. While the macro list covered how to gradually shift from defensive to aggressive, or vice versa, over the course of a match or against multiple teams, the micro checklist will cover individual engagements, going over how to make more rapid adjustments in the heat of the showdown. Uh -huh. For these examples, I think it's best to go over the list first, then talk through some clips while keeping the points in mind. These steps come in the form of things you should be asking yourself, starting with, should I take this fight? While there are scenarios where there isn't a choice, like walking in front of a bush full of Romero enjoyers looking to ambush you, ugh. in the majority of situations, you have the option to simply back out and restart the fight later when it is more advantageous for you to do so. Next up is, am I playing within my effective range? And I don't necessarily mean the stat when I say this. For example, using a shotgun, consider trying to bring the fight indoors. Sniping, 
Try and gain distance and or rotate in between shots to avoid allowing other players to bring you within their comfortable range. Are there players that are so good with certain weapons that they can confidently outplay people at multiple ranges? Sure. But this is the exception to the rule, and will most likely get you killed unless you have many hours on a particular weapon. This is followed closely by, where am I most likely going to win a fight? While this is largely dependent on your loadout, as I described in the previous step, this can change depending on the situation you find yourself in. For instance, perhaps you just approached a boss layer with a team already inside. There hasn't been any fighting yet, so the odds are high that another team comes up behind you. It may be best to rotate to a side of the compound that makes it easier to deal with or stay hidden from approaching teams while still keeping an eye on the layer. You then have to ask yourself, is my cover sufficient? While you may have excellent cover temporarily, I frequently see hunters corner themselves in areas where they have no way to fall back or rotate should the need arise. Even if you have a solid position, you then have to consider, have I been here for too long? Repeaking areas during a fight is a sure way to get killed, or if someone knows you're holding an angle, they may attempt to pull a wide flank on you. Look to find better cover in between each kill attempt, or maintain mobility in close quarters to avoid being predictable. Lastly, and most importantly, is there something breaking parity? What I mean by this is when you go to close in for the kill, what will stop your opponent from simply holding an angle on you and lining up a headshot before you can pull the trigger? Maybe they kite you into a trap or another teammate. Perhaps you trade, and all of your effort you put in feels wasted. You need something to tilt the scales in your favor. Throwables come in big here, using things like explosives to force movement or flashbangs to obstruct vision. Things like decoy fuses or even blank fires are great for disorienting opponents enough to secure a kill. Or techniques like the knock-knock that bait hunters into peeking without needing supplies. Finding ways to poison or light enemies on fire can also help to create openings for aggression. Let's look at a few clips where I can demonstrate this list in action, step by step. In this first clip, I'm attempting to run the gauntlet as the map has been dead silent up until this point. I scan to see that there are players camping the clue at Kingsnake, and after determining that the other boss isn't here, I have to ask myself, should I take this fight? I decide to leave. After all, what do I have to gain from fighting this? They can see my location at all times and are entrenched in a compound with lots of hidden vantage points. The other bounty would most likely get away while I fought, and I would likely die before getting any extra loot or dark sight seconds. It makes far more sense to head towards where the lair will be and let them follow me toward terrain that will work in my favor, or perhaps in other teams, which is exactly what ended up happening. In the next clip, I can demonstrate the entire list in action. Thistlewain and I are heading from Pelican Prison to the boss layer at Seven Sisters when he hears a team running perpendicular to us. This allows us to easily answer the question, should I take this fight, as this is a prime opportunity for an ambush. Coming from Moses, probably to Seven. Okay. Is it a vigil confirmation, or...? No, I just heard a hive aggro. And I hear a lot of grunts that growing right now. Oh, they're probably Get right here, then. melee. He's right here. Okay. Oh shit. 
Our communication was a little rushed, so while Thistlewain was able to start the fight within his effective range, I was not. We end up accomplishing what I was going to suggest anyway, which was him causing a distraction while I flanked. I'm most likely going to win a fight up close, so I start by trying to block off rotations, but this is where things start to go awry. Got a couple tags. While I succeed initially and I do have sufficient cover, we unintentionally swap roles when Thistlewain moves in too close and I stay too far away. This fails the next checklist step, have I been in one position for too long? It would have been far more beneficial for me to push up when the remaining hunter took cover to heal. I'm also lucky that I didn't get shot here through the gaps in the tree I'm pinging. I think he's still behind this, but I'm not sure. He's crouch walking. Yep, there he is. Heading towards you. Fuck you! I'm stuck. I'm dead. Yeah. Now that it's one on one and we are no longer breaking parity with our numbers advantage and angles, I must reassess the checklist. Should I take this fight? The enemy hunter's partner is trapped under a water devil while my partner is accessible and they clearly have no way to cover him. This gives me the leverage I need to take the fight. However, I am not playing within my effective range, as my opponent has taken efforts to gain distance between us. This Elaine also provides me with info on the enemy loadout that tells me my cover is also not sufficient, so I use evasion techniques while trying to close the gap and obtain proper cover. He's Sparks Bornheim, by the way. Oh, fun. Okay. He's just gonna be in a bush camping my body. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think his buddy died in the water, right? Yeah. By maintaining mobility, I can avoid staying in one place for too long, which will go a long way toward not getting shot by who I'm fighting, or another team for that matter. So now I have to seek to break parity. I know if I don't want to get ambushed from the bushes, I'll have to force movement. The decoy fuses I'm carrying are perfect for accomplishing this, telling me what I need to know when I hear footsteps after throwing one. I also keep the sparks in mind, knowing that if need be, I can bait the single shot and close in for the kill. I see him. Good hit. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of carefully thinking things through, and the need to make rapid fire decisions will arise so as to not miss out on an opportunity. What will separate experienced players from newer players is being able to check off these things instinctually, not requiring much in the way of conscious thought in the heat of things. We'll check things off throughout the example in the background, which is a perfect example of when pure aggression is the best tactic. The other bounty team is about to enter our compound while we wait for our banish. Should we take this fight? Absolutely. We have the advantage of holding a compound and the ability to go undetected should the attacking team run out of dark sight. Are we fighting within our effective range? This Elaine is about to hold an angle on the approach, and I'm staying hidden until the enemy gets closer. Our cover is sufficient, as we have the defensive advantage against the other bounty team. This lane secures an advantage with an opening headshot, so I change my position to take map control. Notice a moment of pause as I confirm parity is being broken, when this lane throws the chaos bomb, covering my approach to go pick up the token. They went left, I think. The firebomb on the body further cements right this, 
allowing me to run up and finish the fight without my opponent even realizing I'm above them. Got him. When you play solo, there are some extra things to consider. Most steps from both the macro and micro checklist will be applied the same way regardless, simply needing more frequent reassessment when alone. However, I feel there are a few points that I should add some emphasis to during solo hunts. The first thing that comes to mind is that taking map control can be hard to secure when you're outnumbered, but even so, there are still options. In this situation, map knowledge will go a long way towards manipulating teams into making mistakes. For example, having traps you can kite players into should you need to fall back can help to maintain control over a territory. Controlling resources like supply points near boss layers can apply pressure, or having a position with a view on routes that lead to nearby extractions can help with making a plan on how to best use the terrain. Securing an advantage as a solo versus teams will essentially be defined by finding a way to force one-on-one -on -one fights. The most obvious solution is setting up an ambush, making an attempt to immediately even the numbers as the fight opens. Body coverage can also add to this pressure, allowing for more space to maneuver. However, this can also come in the form of things like catching players in the middle of fighting a boss. Teams will often disengage when they see a red indicator, though, so timing here is key or baiting out bad pushes across ha hazardous terrain like water or causing bottlenecking across bridges. Breaking parity is also extremely important as a solo, and causing status effects will go a long way towards tipping the scales. Special ammo is great for this, but even something as simple as kiting someone through a choke bomb to inhibit aim, or taking advantage of AI aggro, as they often cause bleed or poison, can be just enough to create for openings for aggression. While certain strategies may be frowned upon, as a solo, you do what you must to survive. If you have a way to gain the upper hand, you should probably take it. These checklists are designed to help you gauge how to shift from being defensive to being aggressive. While there can be a lot to think about, it'll become easier with practice. And I'm still practicing it too, believe me. Keep in mind that this doesn't mean each fight needs to be a drawn out affair while you check things off. Depending on your loadout or the scenario you find yourself in, you can use these steps as a guideline for better timing instantaneous direct aggression should the engagement call for it, like in the last clip I show using the abdomat. Let's quickly list out both checklists one more time so everyone watching has a direct reference point in the video. For our macro checklist we had gain information, take map control, dictate the pace of the fight, secure an advantage, and finish the fight without rushing it. For our micro checklist, we had the series of questions to ask ourselves in the form of, should I take this fight? Am I playing within my effective range? Where am I most likely going to win a fight? Is my cover sufficient? Have I been in one position for too long? And finally, is there something breaking parity? In the first episode of Players Won't Teach It, where I talked about evasion, I received a lot of excellent suggestions. So many, in fact, that I'll be able to continue the series for some time to come. So instead of asking for more suggestions, though feel free to give them anyway if you'd like, I would like to ask everyone to participate in the poll to decide the next Players Won't Teach It topic, which you can find amongst my channel community posts here, or over on Twitter if you prefer. I'll put my handle up in the background. Thanks again to everybody for giving so much support to the series. And while the next topic is decided, I hope everyone will also check out the videos going up in the meantime. They'll be comprised of things like highlights, the signature loadout series, and more depending on what I have time for. Until next time though, good hunting in the bayou everyone, and I'll see you all on the next one.